We are tired of praying and marching and thinking and learning. Brothers want to start cutting and shooting and stealing and burning. You are 300 years ahead in equality. But next summer may be too late to look back. I call us the forgotten ones. No one was worried about us until we rioted. Baltimore City is a real tough place. We still have buildings burnt down from the 60s. There's this heroin acts everywhere you turn. But the city made me strong. I ran the streets, you know, I hung on the corners. I hung with the drug dealers. You know, I hung with killers. And it's not nothing that I'm proud of, but that's what I saw every day. We are not bad people, we're just misunderstood. I have witnessed my friends being locked up unjustly. I have been locked up before unjustly. We caught a lot of heat for rioting. and they're destroying their own neighborhood. They're doing it because they want attention. I want people to understand you're dealing with anger, not just of those kids, but those kids' parents and their grandparents. This is aggression that has yet to be released until the Freddie Gray situation. I was on the front lines, but I didn't have a lot of issues as the other photographers because my protesters, my peers had my back. My mother saw me on CNN and she was like, boy, you need to back up, you too close. And I'm like, mom, fine. I'm a protester. So I felt protected. The riots begun when the fans from Camden Yards were at the bars calling us the N-word, monkeys. You know, your cause ain't gonna get done after your cause. They gonna keep killing y'all anyway. I can take the verbal abuse that I was receiving, but the guys that were younger than me, it got to them. You have your rioters and your protesters. Same people with the same goals, they just handle their emotions differently. So when the police came, the protesters were standing, lined up, waiting, and a white man was mixed. The first one to be mixed. The black protesters made sure he got milk in his eyes. He wiped his eyes and went right back on the front line. When you see my pictures and people say my pictures are passionate, it's because this is my city, this is my home. My camera and my phone are my weapons. Social media is like a nuclear bomb if you use it right. Unless you're gonna like delete every Instagram account, every Twitter account, every Facebook account, and take down every blog there is, you have a voice. You can make something go viral with a push of a button. I want history to remember that we didn't have leaders like Malcolm X and MLK, those dynamic men to lead us. These are the people that are fighting now. I'm documenting my history, history that my community will pass down deeper and deeper. I'm not gonna let us be forgotten. This is my community, so I'm gonna fight for it. Um, I think there's a lot of heavy topics we're going to talk about, and I hope that we can have an honest conversation. Um, I hope that my questions, as someone who was raised in a suburban, middle-class South Texas, uh, can be somewhat insightful. So um, I think the first thing maybe we can talk about is give us uh, a sort of background on what happened with the Baltimore uprising. I think that we saw the images in the media, but maybe we don't really understand a lot of the truth of what happened. Um, basically, um, what happened was, you know, Freddie Gray, you know, he was um, locked up and they took him supposedly for a rough ride. Rough ride is basically, you know, when they handcuff you, 
behind your back and then you know you ride on the paddy wagon and they ride rough long hours i've been in the back of a paddy wagon rode around for hours um no rough ride is that bad you know to sever your spine you know his leg was broke when they took him into the paddy wagon and supposedly um they stopped on the way to what they call the bookings um and they beat him some more you know and he never made it you know and from there I found out through text messages, you know, from my peers in my community because um, I grew up about 10 minutes from where everything took place. I'm from West Baltimore, and um, I had friends that knew Freddie Gray, so when it happened in the video, before it even hit the internet, we was receiving it via group text and text messages. So you mentioned this, this phenomenon of rough ride. Um, that is shocking to me because it seems like there's an entire vernacular of the way that police officers treat members of the black community that we would never hear, would never hit the, the news media. Can you talk a little bit more about um, other situations that you hear about that are similar? Um, I done seen a lot of um, situations dealing with the police. It's been times I've been walking home from school and um, I was going to community college and the police pulled me over. They described a guy that looked totally nothing like me and they would dump all my stuff out, you know, looking for drugs or whatever and then wouldn't have nothing to just leave me homework blowing down the street. I've seen guys beat by the police. Um, it's been times I was driving my mother's car. My mother has a pretty nice car, and they say, oh, this car is reported stolen. And I said, if you check the registration in my, my driver's license, our last names are the same. You know, they lock me up. You know, it's, dealing with the police is very difficult. It's not, they're not all bad. I have, I'm, I've made friends with plenty of police officers that want to do good in the community. It, they just don't know how because the hole has been, you know, dug so deep and the hate is so deep as a, as a social norm in Baltimore City. And that social norm really was the pretext for what happened with the uprising. So yeah. why was it that situation where people, you know, what was it in that sort of mix of things that were happening that brought people to that level of, of protest? Um, I, I want people to understand, you know, like with the Freddie Gray situation is, we're all like Freddie Gray. The, I could have been Freddie Gray, you know, if I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. What happened to Freddie Gray is normal. You know, it's the fact that it was caught on video, but this is anger that has been building up for a while in my community. You know, we have a lot of vacant homes, homeless issues. Baltimore City is one of the most heroin populated places in the city. So it's a lot of, it's a dangerous city, but it's a beautiful city at the same time. But there's so many issues that get swept under the rug that no one deals with. So that's, all the emotions just were released through the uprising. It wasn't just Freddie Gray. He was just that last drop in that pot to make it overflow. And what was it that, at that moment, why did it overflow? What was the real precursor? I mean, I guess we know the precursors. What was the really inciting moment other um, than Freddie Gray? It was, it was a peaceful all week. You know, we protested numerous times before anything took place. Um, it really started, it wasn't even between the police and the protesters that really started the uprising. It was, we were protesting, and um, basically what happened was the Orioles fans during the Orioles game, we shut down downtown Baltimore on our own with no help from Baltimore City police. They were only worried about City Hall and Camden Yards, which is our baseball field, because it was a baseball game going on. So um, it was about 2,000 protesters, beautiful. So many different ethnic backgrounds came together for this cause, 2,000 people. Um, what happened was um, it was just so many people we took to the streets. The protesters basically got branched off um, on our way to you know, deal with the police and talk to the police. Um, the Oreo fans that were at the bar across from the stadium were throwing racial slurs. And it was so many different age groups. You know, you're dealing with ages 70 to 13 years old, 10 years old out there. And what happened was due to racial slurs, they called us N-words, monkeys, people who were supporting the cause from different ethnic backgrounds were monkey lovers, and lovers and they laughed and giggled and it was fun, funny to them. And the younger guys about, I'm going to say 16 to 18, those are the ones that sparked the uprising, the younger guys, because they're not used to that. You're talking, dealing with guys who never left their neighborhood. You know, they, they sit in West Baltimore, they or East Baltimore. They never, you know, ventured out. You know, I was the same way at one point in time when I was younger. I stayed in my neighborhood where I felt comfortable. Yeah. Um, within that, you picked up your camera and started documenting. Talk a little bit about your experience as a photographer leading up to that and what really got you in the middle of that. Um, being a photographer, I was always the, the all ball, you know, walking around with a camera. You know, it was, it was not normal at all to, to 
to see me with a camera, let alone anyone else in my community. You know, cameras are like foreign objects, you know, so um, when, it, when it happened, I just felt obligated, and I was building up, you know, my career, learning as I go, you know, because I taught myself. And um, so when Freddie Gray's situation happened, I knew the possibility of riots and everything else because of the mentality of my city. So I just, you know, went out there and just, just documented everything that I could. Every, I didn't want to be biased, so I showed the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, I got um, a lot of backlash from my community. You're showing them destroying police cars, but that's what's going on. You know, you can't complain about media being one-sided. You know, if it bleeds, it leaves, and expect me to do the same thing. You know, I'm going to show the positive things in the neighborhood, the negative, and everything in between. Um, I'm interested, then, what was the original kind of reason that you picked up a camera in the first place? How you, I want to I know young... Devin, <laughs> where did he first um, touch that camera? I'm two and a half years in. It's about to be three years in January. And um, basically, photography saved my life. I would be in a grave if it wasn't for photography. That was my inspiration. You know, I had my daughter when I was 21, and she inspired me to be larger than life. But um, back in um, 2013, I lost both of my best friends. One, which was like my big brother, was shot seven times in front of his house. Um, I went to pay my respects to his mother. Um, with my other best friend, and I, I hugged him, told him I loved him. And then after that, you know, um, I had a photo shoot to do. And it was just for fun, just hanging out with my friends, taking pictures. You know, I'm like the only guy around with a camera, you know, come take pictures. So uh, when I went to go take pictures, I received a call about an hour and a half later that my friend had been shot in the head and killed. So I lost both of my best friends, one Friday and one Saturday at the same time. And then from there, that's when I took it serious. It was like, you know, for them and for myself, you know, this is my ticket out. You know, if it wasn't, for photography, I didn't have to go take any pictures. I wasn't interested in it, and I wasn't aspiring to be a photographer. I would have been with him, and I would be gone too. Yeah, um, we've talked a lot about the the dark side of of Baltimore, but what I've really been struck by in looking at your photos is that there's an incredibly large artistic community there that we just don't hear about at all. Like yeah. our idea of of Baltimore is informed by The Wire. Maybe we follow <laughs> Wheelie Wayne on Instagram. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we've seen Twelve O'clock Boys, but there's a huge community of artists there that are not on our radar. Talk about that. Yeah, it's a large community. You know, it's just people who, even in my community, people who just want to be entrepreneurs, people who just want to get away, just want to get out. You know, they are trying to find ways, and a lot of us have turned to art. If it's rapping, singing, poetry, painting, you know, and then um, we don't have a lot of support from the city, so a lot of us just learn on our own. If we can't go to school, we don't have the funds to go to school or art school, so we just teach ourselves. Um, Baltimore is, you know, it's sectioned off. It's a cultural gap in Baltimore. You know, you have your kids that go to, you know, MICA and the art institutes, and then you have street artists such as myself. You know, I had, you know, I don't, didn't go to school for that, but, you know, they don't communicate. It's totally two different worlds, you know, so my goal is to close that cultural gap because I hang on both things. You know, I, I still hang in the hood. I still hang on my friends, but I also hang with the art kids that go to MICA, that go to these schools, you know, and I think that's important, but that's one of Baltimore's biggest issues. People do not communicate in the community. You know, you, you go to MICA, it's a beautiful facility, and you take two, you turn two, two streets over, and then you're in the projects, and totally two different worlds. Yeah. Um, do you see there being more artists now because of the way that people have access to media and cheaper technology to do the sort of stuff that you're doing? Um, yes, yes. Like I have amazing friends who, you know, even younger kids that I talk to that, you know, they have an iPhone, they go out and take pictures. You know, pictures are amazing, they have wonderful eyes. You know, you have, I run into so many kids that paint and, you know, and the sad part about it is not really, now people are starting to understand it in, you know, in my area, they're starting to cherish it. At first, you know, I, you know, I was young, I could draw, but I tucked it away because I was made fun of, you know, so is people are warming up to it, you know, it's becoming, you're not the all ball anymore, you know, it's being, you know, globalized, so it's something that's coming, becoming more common in my community. Do you think that is um, effectively going to be a strong positive force in um, kind of bringing together the, the disparate sides of Baltimore? Yes, it has a long way to go. Um, I know a lot of kids, even kids that I talk to, um, what happens is they don't see the value in it. They don't understand, you know, being an artist is difficult, you know, and it's easy, other easy ways to make income. You know, you can turn to the streets, you can turn to all these different ways. You know, the average kid wants to, when you ask them, they want to be a football player or a basketball player. 
you know, and when that fails, a lot of them turn to the street, you know, and that's what happens, you know. That's why with me and my situation, I try to give back and I try to stay in the community because I want to show people you can be successful as an artist. You know, you can make a living as an artist, and that's what a lot of these kids don't understand because they don't know any artists. Right. So for this last, last bit here, um, you mentioned that your art, your photography has been your ticket out. Um, tell us a bit about where that ticket has taken you so far. It's pretty impressive over the last few years what you've been able to do. <laughs> um, since the cover of Time, you know, the cover of Time, those guys taught me a lot. He had the cover of Time magazine, guys, if you didn't. Anybody <laughs> yeah. else here had a cover of Time magazine? No? Okay. So um, from right. Time magazine, um, I was able to work with Instagram and other places. I actually opened up my own um, exhibition at this museum. You know, I did wheat pasting, blew the pictures up to about eight feet tall. The um, exhibit is completely free, so I've been doing a lot of speaking engagements to kids and going around and speaking. Um, I'm currently freelancing for Under Armour, working, on, working with them permanently. I just came back from Asia from photographing Steph Curry. Um, I also started my own program, teaching inner city kids photography. Um, I started um, a GoFundMe, and um, from that, Russell Simmons saw it, picked it up, donated $20,000, so I'm teaching inner city kids photography. I'm going around talking on my way to Austria to talk over there, you know, just taking it all in day by day and trying to, you know, uplift my community. Um, Tom named me the top photographer in Maryland, which was amazing, and then my city named me the top photographer in my city. So it's just yeah, it's whatever. Right? <laughs> no, it's, <laughs> I'm just taking it all in, you know, it's still a dream to me. You know, my biggest thing is just giving back to my community because there's so many other kids like me, you know, if I can just get them while they're young, you know, and then put a camera in their hand, you know, the possibilities are endless. You know, I don't want the story to just, you know, oh, Devin was an amazing photographer from Baltimore, he moved on. You know, I want to, you know, plant, even if I don't see these seeds grow and blossom, you know, I just want to be able to plant those seeds for the next generation. You're going to make me cry in front of all these <laughs> <laughs> No, I just, you know, there's not a lot of people, they, a lot of people don't make it out of Baltimore. You have me, people like Carmelo Anthony. Um, we have a boxer coming out of Baltimore by the name of Tank, but there's not a lot of people, you know, it's hard. You know, so I'm kind of like a rare breed, so I want to make that no more. You know, I want a whole bunch of successful young artists just popping up out of everywhere in Baltimore City. And then within that, maybe talk a bit about the challenges of being a black photographer who wants to tell stories that are about real social issues um, in a media landscape that doesn't often want to see those stories. Um, it's, it's, it was kind of, it's kind of difficult because um, like the photojournalism world completely like tore me down, you know, because they say I don't know how to completely document a story, but. They're mean in general. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they gonna see though, but <laughs> um, I bought me a recorder and everything. They, I'm gonna start really telling stories, but it's just been difficult getting sponsorships and getting people to, you know, help with my program. I've been turned down a lot, you know, and it, it hurts, but I've made, like when I come to festivals and things like this, I meet amazing photographers who, you know, they give me pointers and, um, they say, well, you know, try this way, try that way. So I'm making a lot of connections. Um, but the biggest thing is like trying to get, you know, the program off the ground, um, getting jobs and, you know, trying to bring people to Baltimore to do things. So most people just want to interview me and then, then th that's it. I try to bring people into the community to try to work and it's kind of difficult. I've pitched a couple ideas to people and they're hitting me, oh, we are loan you a camera, but we want, we want to own all your pictures and then you have to get the camera back. So it's like, what am I getting out of this? Right. You know, but um, it's like being here, Samsung reached out to me, you know, gave me a camera, wanted to do work with me, so that was amazing, so shout out to them, you know, but it's difficult, but I just rolled with the punches, you know, Baltimore made me strong, so I'm just going to keep pushing and try to break those, you know, those barriers for, you know, black photographers everywhere and definitely in journalism. You know, it's a lot of stories, you know, we're not getting able to tell the raw essence of our own stories. You know, someone else is always documenting that. You know, I want more of us to document our own stories, even in fashion photography. You know, you know, we have to, you know, start doc documenting that. And, you know, there's a lot of trials and tribulations that a lot of people don't talk about, you know, that I'm going to talk about. <laughs> Super inspiring, man. We, uh, we all love your work. Thank you so Thank much you. for Appreciate doing this interview. It. Yeah. Thanks, Evan.